ahead and get started. Um, welcome to our Women's Earth and Climate Action Network side event, Women Leading Solutions on the Front Lines of Climate Change. My name is Osprey Oreo Lake, and I am the founder and executive de director of We Can International. And uh, I'm just going to go down the row and uh, introduce our wonderful panelists, Thelmisa Hussein from the Voice of Women Maldives. Uh, sitting next to her is Nima Namandu from Sefeco, from the also Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, Democratic Republic of Congo. Sitting next to her is uh, Marta Cecilia Ventura from Guatemala. And next to her is Cecilia Flores um, from Chile. And they both are part of the Abya Yala Women Messengers delegation, which we are also partnering with them um, here at the COP. And sitting next to her is Precious Firi, the Regeneration International and Earth Wisdom from Zimbabwe. And next to her is Carmen Caprilis of Reaction Climatica from Bolivia. So we really have a wonderful international panel uh, to talk to you today. And uh, we may have another speaker coming in. We'll see, and I'll introduce her if that should happen. The first thing I want to do is to welcome all of you and also to thank and honor the Amazigh people and to say we stand in solidarity with their struggles. We've been learning a lot about their work here, the Emider uh, resistance movement, and we think it's really important to ally with frontline struggles and to give a shout out to our allies there. We were able to have them be at our event, many of them, um, that was held in downtown Marrakesh, and we're, we're sad that we were not able to see any of them get accreditation to be in the blue zone with us, but we bring their heart and spirit with us. Today, we're gonna to be hearing from this incredible group of women leaders who will address the root causes, struggles, and policies that are really at the heart of the climate crisis. Uh, there are many grassroots indigenous and frontline women that are gathered at the COP to really strategize together. And I think this is a really important time to work on our collective efforts. Uh, we need to really look at the fact that women are working worldwide in defense and protection of the earth in face of uh, the climate crisis and dangerous neoliberal economic structures and also legal systems that treat nature as a commodity instead of the sacred system of life. And for this, we really need to recognize the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth. The UN has confirmed that even under the Paris Agreement, global temperature rise will in fact be a tragic three degrees Celsius. Obviously, this is not what we need. This is not the time to be timid or think we are in a rehearsal for a later date. There is no later date. The time is now for a transformative revolution on, based on social and ecologic justice. And for this, all of our studies and research show, as many other organizations, you need women's leadership. And let it be said loud and clear that women are not going to stop speaking out and demonstrating until we keep 80% of fossil fuel reserves in the ground, stop deforestation and ocean pollution, implement gender equality, respect indigenous rights and the rights of nature, and immediately finance a transition to 100% renewable energy. We have to stay below 1.5 degrees rise. And as the new report from Oil Change International makes clear, there literally can be no new fossil fuel developments, as in period, not one more drop. This is our red line to protect and defend Mother Earth, all species, and the very web of life. Women are making really a significant difference in changing our current trajectory, and we need to accelerate their power at every level of decision making. It's really important to understand how key they are for solutions, and they need to be at the forefront. From the highest levels of decision making to the grassroots women, uh, we need them to be leading the way. And because I don't want to take up a lot of I would encourage you to go to our website and find this report. It's over 100 pages. It really documents how women are being impacted the most by climate change and environmental degradation, but also goes through a lot of the solutions and why you need to have them in the forefront. Um, there's so many stats, but I'm going to skip over that because I really want to get us to, to our panelists. Um, we must recognize the struggle of women on the front lines uh, to both the climate change impacts and also um, our extractive economy, particularly indigenous women. 
Um, I've been very honored to be on the ground at Standing Rock in North Dakota to support incredible Indigenous women at the forefront of the Dakota Access Pipeline resistance effort. The women's voices shine boldly with dignity, wisdom, and love and strength in the midst of really horrifying and unlawful violence by state and corporate actors, including attacks by dogs, mace, pepper spray, and strip searching those arrested during peaceful actions to protect water from a pipeline which would transport 470,000 barrels of oil every day and threaten massive damage to land and waterways. The women are rising to say colonization must end Sacrifice zones and environmental racism must end. Violence against women's bodies by extractive industries must end. The desecration of indigenous sacred sites and violations against indigenous rights, all these must end. I want you to hear with me now their powerful voices calling out from Standing Rock. Miniwikoni, which means water is life. Say with me, water is life. Water is life. Water is life. Water is life. And we really need to remember that we can't live without the earth and all that the earth gives to us. They are offering many solutions, these indigenous women. And one that is so important is to remind us of our inseparable connection to the earth. This is a solution, they tell us. I had the honor to be with indigenous women in Ecuador earlier this year as they organized for a historic march to protect the Amazon rainforest and to demand their rights and protection after their own government has been criminalizing them for standing up to stop oil extraction in their territories. And again, we see solutions coming out of these indigenous communities with strong women's leadership. The Sariaco peoples are offering their proposal of the living forest, which protects the Amazon rainforest from an indigenous worldview. I'd encourage you to look that up online, the Living Forest Proposal. One of our goals, as we can at COP22, is a call to action for the protection and rights of defenders of the land. Global Witness has reported that last year, over 185 land defenders and environmental activists were killed around the world. 40% of them were indigenous. When indigenous land and water protectors are murdered or criminalized, we must speak out and take action. 80% of all the biodiversity left on earth is in the hands of indigenous peoples. And our sisters and brothers are putting their bodies on the line every single day to protect lands, forests, and waterways. And I think we need to really ask ourselves, where are we in this fight on the front lines? Uh, we should be doing this to protect first and foremost indigenous people's rights to their way of life. But also, we need to understand they're putting on their body on the line for all of us. We all need water, we all need forests, we all need air. Where are we? Where are our bodies? So with this, I think it's also to, important to understand that it is really past time to defend and honor and listen to frontline women as we stand together to protect all future, future generations. And I think a really deep-seated kernel that needs to be understood is that how we treat the earth is how we're treating women and vice versa. Violence against the earth is directly linked to violence against women and our patriarchal, colonized, imperialized, capitalist systems are really based upon power over women and the earth. And we need to have this broader systemic analysis. And this paradigm has now come to its very destructive conclusion, resulting in multiple crises from the climate crisis to massive environmental degradation, from economic injustice manifested in our neoliberal economy to environmental racism. These are underlying issues we simply cannot ignore here inside the halls of COP22. So together, today here, we are sending a message to world leaders that enough is enough and it is time to immediately leave fossil fuels on the ground and transition to a clean, just, decentralized, democratized and sustainable energy future. And to do this, it's essential that we bring frontline and indigenous women's voices to the forefront of the climate conversation and to indeed show that another world is possible. Thank you. And with that, thank you. Ah, okay, great, terrific. Please join us on stage. Um, we have Sadie, uh, if you could help me, we did not get to meet in advance. If you could just take a second and just say your name and where you're from. My name is uh, Sadie Phoenix Lavoie. 
uh, from Sagin First Nation uh, in Manitoba in Canada. Welcome, and we're so glad you could join us. Thank you so much. So with that, Thelmisa Hussein, please, if you would uh, speak. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me here. Um, it's really wonderful to be among such strong women from around the world, from all walks of life, but united on a common front. I was a diplomat and I used to be a negotiator, but today I'm here from civil society. Today I'm here as a mother and I'm here as a climate activist. I'm from the Maldives. Maldives is tropical paradise on earth, but it is also one of the lowest lying countries most vulnerable to climate change. I don't need to explain to you the vulnerabilities of uh, small island nations. Climate change is not a stranger to Maldivians and many small island states around the world. Maldivians are living through the impacts of climate change, just like so many island nations and vulnerable communities. According to the report that came out in May, there is massive coral, coral bleaching across the entire country on all our reefs, an average of about 60% bleaching, and in some areas up to 90% bleaching. The entire economy and livelihood of the people are dependent on these reefs. It is scientifically proven fact that in order to save the island nations around the world, we must limit the global temperature rise by 1.5 degrees Celsius, right? 1.5 degrees Celsius to stay alive. We have only 350 tons of degrees Celsius. Business as usual will consume the entire carbon budget within five years, just five years we would juice up the entire carbon budget that is just continuing as usual without firing up any new coal plants. And we think some future imaginary technology that does not exist yet is going to save us. Do you know what it would mean to us, to our families? It means that my nieces and nephews, my uncles and aunts, my cousins, friends, would lose their homes. Many of them would lose their lives. It means that we would become climate refugees. There are going to be climate refugees from many vulnerable communities around the world. IPCC estimates there will be 150 million climate refugees in the next 40 years. DARA International says, we are seeing 400,000 deaths every year because of climate change. 400,000 deaths every year. This is a genocide happening. This is an ecocide. This is criminal. We cannot let this go on. How is it okay? Where is the justice? We cannot have climate justice without ensuring survival of every single person on this planet. That includes the most vulnerable communities. Meanwhile, we have our politicians supported by the fossil fuel industry. We cannot afford to open a new dirty energy plant. We need to shut down the existing plants. We know that, but all around the world, we see new coal plants being fired up. That sounds crazy, right? Because that is crazy. We have Japan opening new coal plants. Indonesia is making plans to boost energy, which is really good, but not when 60% of that is going to come from coal. And then we have New Zealand continuing to subsidize the fossil fuel industry. EU's renewable energy legislation lacks ambition, fails to send a strong message to the green industry, which we so desperately need. And India and China's romance with fossil fuel industry continues. USA, let's not even talk about USA. My heart bleeds for USA. They just elected a climate skeptic into office. What does that mean? It's like saying we are electing a person into office who believes Earth is flat. It's that bad. We are letting these money hungry, power mongering corporations rule and destroy our planet. They are buying our politicians. 
They are these monsters have taken over our planet. They are trashing it and they are murdering our people. And now we see these same companies walk in the corridors of this conference facility. What business does this fossil fuel industry have walking and lobbying our negotiators? In many cases, they send their representatives in country delegations and they're actually in the negotiating rooms negotiating the climate deal. Polluters out, polluters out, say with me, polluters out, polluters out, polluters out. This fight is no longer between the rich and the poor. This fight is no longer between the developed and the developing countries. This is a fight between those who are willing to act on climate and those who refuse to act. This is a fight between those who are raising their voices and those who choose to stay silent. As mothers, we cannot afford to be silent. Future of our children, our children, our grandchildren will be determined by what we choose to do. We must stand with courageous defenders of water at Standing Rock, with the Canadian tar sand resistant movement, Amazon rainforest marches. Future will be determined by what we choose to do today. What we do is the only hope left for our future. This is our one and only chance to save the planet. We must stay united with the courageous defenders of Mother Earth. If you want to learn more about the fossil fuel companies walking on the corridors of this, uh, this conference center, please go check out the website of Corporate Accountability International. We must make sure our voices are heard, heard loud, loud and clear. Being in a negotiating room is no longer enough. You need to speak up and you need to speak out. We have a moral obligation to protect our children, our future and their future, their children's future. Act on climate with me. Act on climate. Act on climate. Act on climate. Louder. I'm sure you can do better than this. Act on climate. Act on climate. Never again shall we let these fossil fuel companies silence our voices. We must organize, we must resist, and the movement has begun. It has begun with women around the world leading the way. We march forward, united, hand in hand. Act on climate, act, act on, on climate. climate, act, act on, on climate. climate. And one more time, polluters out, polluters out. Polluters out. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's so hard to talk after diploma. <laughs> you know, I'm in the grassroots woman. I'm from the kitchen in where I cook traditionally with wood. That is Nema. My name is Nema Namadamo. I'm from uh, Republic Democratic du Congo. Je suis contre de parler l'anglais parce que c'est ça le développement. Mais je vais changer. Je vais parler en anglais, mais je suis contre de parler français et anglais. Uh, my name is Zinema Namadamu. I'm from DRC Congo and I'm work with Weekend. You see that on back on us. And my organization name is Synergie des Associations Feminines du Congo, SAFECO. We work on the ground. Today we come here to talk about frontline women, their solution, how they are solution because is really really hard to talk about today this she say pol pol out. Politas out politas out who is politas who is politas or who is not that is a big question when we have this problem some people they don't see that problem 
that is a global problem. We must have a solution problem to resolve solution globally, solution globally and problem globally is is world problem and we must have global solutions. That is really sometimes making me so hard to talk about these issues, about land, about water, about Africa. That is so much really happen in the world, is a global problem, but is really so hard for African countries. We live naturally, we live without air conditioning. We don't have a road to pollution things. We don't have medicine. We live consequence where in no countries they met this problem and they don't want to make a solution. Where is good, you are also affected. And this is no joke. We must act. This is a moment to act because this climate change has again image about indigenous women or African women, poor people, women. No, this must is, is a global problem. You can be in the office, you can talk really, really good English or French or you know computer, you know everywhere, everything you can do. But with climate change, we are all affected. And sometimes we have a solution where the solution is only planting trees. And over these people, they are here. We have a, a president, we have a diplomat like her, the people, former diplomat. But where is the problem issues is back on the ground. Because women, they are the solution. Why? There is on the ground. The planting trees, this is the life. No joke is now we are having. We walk and we're planting trees. We have this problem. Where is climate justice? Women, they are planting trees without material, without glove, without no shoes appropriate, no car to transport the seed. And the people that are here, we are negotiating. Why we are negotiating? Let's all going on those boats where the climate change and we are going to die all together. Wherever you are, things happen and happen, and we need to react. And women really, they are working on the front line. And this is a big question. When we ask a support, they say, oh, they don't have a capacity. What the capacity is, those patriarchal system have this put women in that image. They don't have a capacity. They don't know how to do report. That is administration. I heard so much administration. And when we talk women to give education for our kids, our husband, our community, you can't separate the women with the community. And women in particular, they are affected. They are African women because they are on the ground. They work. Adult trees, we can't eat. Adult trees, we can't have light because night is only, we have natural light from where we have to cook with. And that is the, where we have really, really big problem, challenging, and water with these mining companies. Because when I say about my country, my country, you know, DRC is the re second rainforest after Amazon forest around the world. And also is big, rich country with minerals. All minerals they are using on those computer, on airplane, everything digital is from almost from DRC. And when they come to explore those minerals and water and those bad conditions, people, when they drink those water, they die, and animals. But those is consequence we are living about climate change. And we need really to act. And we need to plant more trees because people need oxygen. You are going to breathe because with climate change, no border. And also with oxygen, no border. We needed to act, we need to plant trees, and thank you so much. Muy buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Soy Marta Cecilia Maya Quiche de Guatemala.
Um, good afternoon to everybody. My name is Marta Cecilia from Guatemala. Hoy es un día muy importante para todas las personas del mundo que nos encontramos acá en Marrakech. ¿Cuál es nuestro objetivo de cada uno y de cada una que estamos acá? Um, today is a very important day for all of us that are here in Marrakech. Uh, and we have to think about the objectives, why we are here uh, in COP. Nuestro objetivo principal de nosotras es proponer y visibilizar una propuesta que traemos desde las mujeres de los diferentes países de Latinoamérica del Abya Yala. Because um, we, give, we women came here with a very specific objective to share with you the proposals and the messages of the women of the Abya Yala. Un proceso que hemos construido que lo hemos llamado el Chasqui Warni. A project that we have built that is called Chasqui Warni. El Chasqui Warni es un proceso que hemos construido desde los saberes ancestrales de las mujeres de los diferentes cosmovisiones que, que practicamos en el mundo, como también principalmente en Latinoamérica. Uh, Chasqui Warmi is a project to share the visions of women that are now living in Abiyala in Latin America. Mujeres mensajeras. Women. Significa que de una mujer, el pensamiento de las compañeras, lo llevamos nosotros y hacemos una red en los diferentes espacios y en los diferentes partes del continente. Women that are messengers. So they, they have built this network with women with different voices, different cultures, in order to share different messages and to agree in certain things. And that's why they're here to bring this message. Estos saberes de las mujeres en cuanto al rescate de las semillas, en cuanto a los pensamientos, el uso y práctica de la medicina natural, muchas veces no son visibilizadas, muchas veces no son consideradas sino que por eso nosotros estamos acá para proponer, para traer esa propuesta de que queremos que se plantea un modelo de desarrollo diferente, porque nosotros sabemos que todo eh, nuestra cosmovisión tiene otra forma de ver el mundo. All our knowledge, our knowledge of seeds, our traditional knowledge about medicine, uh, here has no value. That's why we're here with this proposal in order to uh, talk with the leaders and tell them that this model of development is wrong and uh, because they have a different conception and, uh, and they believe that development should be different. Porque para nosotros todo tiene vida, todo es sagrado, nuestro territorio, el agua, la lluvia, todo tiene vida. Por eso nosotros no estamos de acuerdo con la política de desarrollo extractivista, queremos que el petróleo quede bajo tierra. Uh, That's why we believe that everything is alive, water, the river, the land, everything has life. And that's why we want to stop these policies, extractivist policies in, in our country, because we want, uh, we want to keep these things alive. Todos y todas tenemos que ser chasquiwarni, tenemos que ser mensajeras, tenemos que trasladar ese mensaje a todo el mundo. Uh, she, she asked everybody to join Chasqui Warmi. That means women messenger, because we all have to carry on with this message of life. Nosotras exigimos la justicia ambiental, porque nos duele que nuestra madre tierra, nuestro territorio, sea eh, como extractivista para el modelo de desarrollo que hasta el momento ha creado el sistema capitalista. That we are now fighting, asking for uh, climate and environmental justice because this uh, capitalist model has, is destroying our, our nature. Nosotros hemos hecho un esfuerzo a través de los rituales, de nuestras ceremonias, de proteger la tierra, de proteger el agua. Sin embargo, por el otro lado, hay un sistema de desarrollo en donde cada vez más nos quitan esa vida. Uh, We have done uh, lots of efforts, lots of rituals in order to protect what for them is sacred. But uh, the destructivist industry doesn't have limits. So it's overcoming uh, uh, all, all, all these limits and affecting the ways of life. 
hacemos un llamado a todos y todas a que todas podemos articular esa red, esta red de todas las mujeres, porque consideramos que somos la población mucho más vulnerable y estamos sintiendo el efecto del cambio climático, porque el ciclo cambia, el crecimiento de los niños ha cambiado, el desarrollo de las especies ha cambiado y todo por los cambios que se ha generado. Well, she wants to make a call for everybody to join Chasqui Women because they have they are seeing that the cycles are changing. Then the children growth uh, has changed. The, the 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 species are changing. So that's why she thinks it's time for a change. Nosotras no somos el problema. Nosotros somos parte de la solución porque los pueblos indígenas y particular las mujeres por más de miles de años hemos conservado el pensamiento y eso de va de generación en generación. Por eso nosotras las mujeres nos hemos declarado protectoras de la madre tierra. Uh, she says that women are not the problem, not the victims. They are the solutions. So that's why they have inherited from their ancestors their different ways of life, their understanding of nature. So that's why they are they are here uh, fighting for what uh, for their land. Hacemos este llamado entonces a unir a este Chasquiwarni en nivel del mundo, a las compañeras de África, de Asia, de todos los continentes, nos sentimos parte de esa solución para que todo ese proceso vaya en particular a las mujeres que estamos enfrente de este cambio. Yeah, she wants to make a call to all women from Asia, from Africa to join the Chasquiwarni in order to generate the change that is needed and to protect the earth. Por eso estamos acá para decirle a los gobiernos, a las empresas, a las ONGs, a la cooperación internacional que realmente no estamos de acuerdo. Tiene que haber eh, políticas viables y que también sea beneficie particularmente a las mujeres, a los pueblos indígenas, porque ahorita los proyectos van con enfocado forestal, proyectos de red, pero nosotros queremos proyectos que realmente beneficien a nosotros las mujeres. Muchas gracias. Well, uh... And they are here to ask the governments, to ask NGOs, to ask the international cooperation that they want, uh, that they don't want these projects, this forest project, these pro, uh, projects that are based on red. They want projects that are productive, projects uh, focused on women and women livelihoods, pro, uh, projects that they can get a benefit out of it. Uh, and thank you very much. Una mata gilatanaca, Juliana Canaja, Nayan Sutima, Cecilia Flores. Buenas tardes a todos y todas. Mi nombre es Cecilia Flores. Good afternoon. Her name is Cecilia Flores. She's from, from Chile. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm from Chile, sector montaña. From the mountains in Chile. Bueno, eh, quería manifestarle un poco eh, la vivencia, digamos, en el sector montaña. She wants to share how it's the livelihoods in the mountains. La afección en cuanto al incremento del viento, las altas temperaturas, las sequías. The pressure on uh, the, the new, the, the high, high land pressure, new winds, the, the droughts la afección a los calendarios agrícolas que nosotros hemos manejado ancestralmente para nuestros cultivos y producción. The changes that their uh, agricultural calendar have been suffered and this calendar uh, they have inherited from their ancestors. Las mujeres indígenas siempre hemos sido luchadoras, the pero eso siempre ha estado invisibilizado. The indigenous women have always been warriors, but Uh, that has never been visualized. Hoy nos encontramos luchando en defensa de nuestros territorios. Today we're fighting for in defense of our territories. Nuestros territorios están siendo violentados. Our territories have been uh, violated. Están siendo violentados por el mal llamado desarrollo. They are violated by the, the, the what, what we call development. 
por el extractivismo. By the extractivism. Y ahora por el calentamiento global. And today by global warming. Los estados tienen que entender que los pueblos indígenas hemos cuidado de nuestros espacios durante más de 520 años. The countries have to understand that we have taken place, uh, taking care of our territories for more than five, uh, 520 years. Que nosotros sabemos convivir en equilibrio con la madre tierra. That we know how to live in harmony with nature. Que, este, que lo que está sucediendo nos está afectando tan profundamente como es nuestra propia vida. That what's going on is affecting us so deeply that it's our own lives. Que se visibilice el aporte que tenemos los pueblos indígenas de poder mantener el equilibrio en nuestra tierra. Uh, I hope that uh, the efforts that we're doing are visualized in order to have our planet on balance. Nosotros vamos a seguir trabajando eh, con nuestras propuestas de mantención, de mitigación, de adaptación, propuestas que hemos usado siempre y por eso seguimos existiendo. Uh, we're going to keep on pushing for our proposals uh, of adaptation, of mitigation, thanks to which we are still alive. El territorio para nosotros es importante, es parte de nuestra vida, es nuestra convivencia, es un todo. Y eso lo tienen que entender los estados porque nos están quitando la vida. Uh, the territory for us is everything, it's our house, it's our home. And that's one thing that the, the parties have to understand, that uh, these territories uh, uh, are our own. Hoy las mujeres estamos al frente de esta lucha. Today, women are in the front lines of this struggle. Porque para nosotros es nuestra existencia. Si en nuestros territorios están siendo violentados, no nos queda vida. Because for us, the territory is our, uh, our own territory. If we don't have the territory, uh, what, do we, what do we have? So this is affecting our own lives. Se, se daña el agua. Merma el agua, no hay agua en montaña. Uh, the water is every, every day less. The water has been damaged. So uh, we're seeing lo loss of, of water in the mountains. Se contamina nuestro aire. Our air is contaminated. Las temperaturas altas producen sequías. High temperatures produce droughts. Nuestros camélidos Llamas, alpacas, mueren por ser. Uh, our, our animals, the llamas, alpacas, are dying because of the drought. Todo lo que para nosotros es subsistencia está siendo afectado. Everything that for us is uh, for thriving has been affected. Por eso queremos que este mensaje llegue no solamente a los estados, porque ellos toman las decisiones. That's why we want our message to be heard by the parties because they are the ones that are taking the decisions. Pero sino a la sociedad en general, porque lo que hoy a nosotros nos afecta va a afectarnos a todos. But not only to them, but to uh, all society, because what is affecting right now to us eventually will affect everybody. Si nuestras montañas ocurren los deshielos, después no va a haber agua. If in our mountains the glaciers uh, melt, we are not going to have water. Y sin agua no hay vida. And without water, there is not life. Queremos que ustedes se hagan parte de nuestra voz y la extiendan por todo el mundo. Uh, we want everybody to, uh, to help us disseminate our voice so everybody can hear us. Las mujeres indígenas seguiremos luchando. The indigenous women are going to keep on fighting. Luchando por la vida y luchando junto a muchas más mujeres. Fighting for life and fighting as a, uh, besides many other women. Luchando por la subsistencia de nosotros, de nuestra madre tierra y de todos los que vienen por detrás. Uh, fighting for ourselves, fighting for our mother nature and fighting for whoever is going to come next. Ahora es cuando se deben tomar las decisiones para que el futuro no se vea afectado. 
Por eso que estamos acá en COP. Today is the time to take decisions so our future can be guaranteed. That's why we are here in COP. Para que los estados se den cuenta de la urgencia que tiene en la existencia futura de las nacionalidades indígenas. To the, we are here to tell the, the states that they have to take urgent action if we want a prosperous future. Y de las familias, mujeres y niños que estamos siendo afectados. And to talk about the families, the women and the children that are being affected. Compañera, la lucha continúa. Empezó hace un tiempo, pero continúa, continúa y continúa. The struggle keeps on going and keeps on going, and we have to be together because the struggle keeps on going. Todos juntos, nosotros le invitamos a ustedes, nosotros nos sumamos a ustedes, ustedes súmense a nuestra voz. Uh, we want to add ourselves to your struggles, and we want you to invite you to join our struggles so we can have one voice. Las mujeres estamos ahí. Women, we are there for Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity this afternoon. I am humbled and inspired by all the women that have spoken. They've inspired me to tell you a bit about my story. My name is Precious Piri. I'm from Zimbabwe. I am a native of Zimbabwe. I grew up in the rural Zimbabwe. I grew up with my grandmother. She took care of uh, seven of us and we were all girls. So I have firsthand experience and so do many others who come from Africa of seeing how women have to work so hard to find food, have to work hard to fend for their families and to take care of things. But also in that process of growing up, I had lessons that I learned. I had my mind triggered towards finding solutions and finding solutions that will last in terms of changing our lives as people of the earth and humans of the earth, women and children included. I grew up in an area that is arid and I still live there and I have the opportunity to work there. I remember one particular year when we had to work in other people's fields so that we get food to feed ourselves. In my heart of hearts, I was like, this can't continue forever. And I saw my grandmother, a very strong woman, who kept us from getting into early marriages because we were seven and it was difficult to take care of us. And that made me see that, of course, there is a chance. There is something that can be done. And today, I'm going to introduce to you what I feel and what many others in this room feel can be done. The biggest ally that we have as humans to heal the earth, to reverse climate change is right under our feet. That is the soil. In Africa, deserts are advancing and most of the world's grasslands, which is 8.3 billion acres, we have advancing deserts. And the grasslands of Africa are habitats of wild herbivores. They are taking care of our lives. I met a man named Alan Savory, who initiated an, an initiative that I can call a decision-making framework called holistic management, which is a way of managing your life, your land, leading to a future that you desire. We all desire to feed ourselves. We all desire a cooler climate. And holistic management uses well-managed livestock using holistic grazing planning to revive grasslands in Africa. And it's now all over the world. I can tell you that there, is, there are many options in Africa, but our land is our source. About 44 to 57% of industrial practices right now are emitting, um, 44 to 57% of gases are emitted using industrial agriculture. That's a lot. And there's a lot that we can change in our agri practices. And at grassroots level in Zimbabwe, in Africa, in the rest of Southern Africa, women are taking a lead. We are healing our grasslands, supplying food for our families for over eight months when we couldn't do it before. Before we could only feed ourselves for three to four months. Right now, as I speak, 50 million of Southern and Eastern African people 
are in urgent need of food. And the most of that population is women. And governments are spending millions. They are yet to spend more if we continue doing business as usual. It's about time, I feel, we focus on the ground. We focus on building the soil organic matter, capturing water, capturing the excess carbon that is in the atmosphere, at the same time reducing the emissions. If we work hard on reducing emissions completely and reviving the grasslands of the world and the croplands of the world, we are, science is proving this, and there are books in your seats that we left so that you take care. We can totally go back to, to pre-industrial um, levels of carbon in the atmosphere in five years. That is 350 parts per million. There is hope in this, but the call is everybody should join hands wherever you are. Regenerate your soil, regenerate your, your lands, regenerate your wilderness, your habitats, your garden in the cities and everywhere. That is our call. I represent an organization called Regeneration International, and that is our strong message. I welcome you all to join our online hub which is called the Regeneration Hub. This is not about individualism. It is about people holding hands together, including women, because we are in the front lines of worrying about everyday food. Let's do this together. That is my call to you. And I, I am so happy, proud as a Zimbabwean, in Zimbabwe, the first woman in government who took up this is here in this house. She works in the Ministry of Women Affairs she is doing holistic management with women in the communities. Her name is Tariro. I saw her and I was happy. And I am calling everyone to join Zimbabwe and the rest of the world to do this. Thank you. Hello. Buju Anin Tanse, Bonaku Magazine Kwe, and Digital Class, Segin and Dudi, and connect with them. Um, my, my English name is Sadie Phoenix Lavoy, um, but my spirit name is Looking Eagle Woman. I'm from uh, Seguin uh, Anishinaabe Nation in Canada, uh, part of Treaty 1 territory, and I am a member of the Turtle Clan. Um, the Turtle Clan in my territory means truth, bringing forth truth, um, which is probably one of the reasons why I ended up here, um, to share a little bit of that with you. Um, so I wanted to share um, some of the things that are happening in Canada, uh, specifically in the past few years. Um, the I don't know more movement. I, I'm I don't know who's heard about it or you know things like that. But I wanted to highlight um, the awakening that it had on many Indigenous peoples, uh, particularly women. Um, in Canada, in the US, and even across the world. But it was led by four women who were frustrated with the government colonial policy um, that were wanting to get rid of environmental protections over a lot of millions, 89 million uh, bodies of lakes and waters and rivers to pave the way for industry to be able to um, not go through environmental assessment so that they could uh, approve pipelines and expand tar sands uh, in Alberta. So they, uh, they did a call out and uh, the community reacted and, and responded by holding flash mobs, rallies, marches and vigils and, um, and, and many things to uh, highlight um, the destruction that was happening on Mother Earth and uh, the government's poor uh, responsibility towards the environment. Um, you know, during this I Don't Know More movement, I participated as much as possible. Um, I saw it as my calling as a in, uh, young Indigenous woman. Um, they talked about women uh, understanding the sacredness of water because they were water ca carriers uh, within their, their womb uh, because they give life and therefore understood uh, water. Um, women are seen as emotional, but it's the spirit of water that comes through our eyes. And it's things like that um, that really led me to ceremony and understanding the, the defense against uh, becoming a water protector and, uh, and def um, against the fossil fuel industry in Canada. Um, I strive for climate justice everywhere I go um, and I push for indigenous rights and recognition, um, even here within COP. 
uh, with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the rights to uh, control lands, resources, uh, even though that's traditionally occupied. Um, because obviously Indigenous peoples in Canada have faced genocide uh, from the colonial government that it is in control now and put in Indian Act governments uh, to control them and to speak on our behalfs. Um, but I just want to say that no Indian Act chief or uh, government speaks on my behalf. Um, I've, I've been one of the 99 youth that were arrested on Parliament Hill uh, just recently, a couple weeks ago, uh, protesting against the Kinder Morgan pipeline because the, the government is supposed to uh, approve this pipeline next month and then actually in a few weeks. Uh, and I, I find it ironic that I got arrested on uh, Parliament Hill, which was supposed to be a democratic building, but also the fact that Ottawa is on unceded Algonquin territory. Um, I also went to Standing Rock uh, back in August when I saw the retaliation that was going on. Um, I felt it in my heart to be there on the front lines uh, to push for the awareness around Standing Rock and to build a solidarity uh, with our brothers and sisters and the women and the children and the elders, uh, regardless of the colonial uh, border that has been set up between Canada and the United States. Um, I, I also want to, I also push, I also want to highlight the fact that, you know, climate change doesn't care about borders and therefore want to do solidarity across all the world and, and the fight that we are all striving for, for uh, real justice and, and a just transition that acknowledges the indigenous rights. And with that, the traditional governance that um, these colonial governments have undermined for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, Canada subsidizes the fossil fuel industry by $3.3 billion, uh, but somehow doesn't seize carbon pricing as their only solution, but is heavily subsidizing the, the fossil fuel industry, which I find no, um, very contradictory and slightly ironic. And um, the Canada made the commitment to 1.5 degrees Celsius carbon budget, but uh, is, is still pushing the, uh, and allowing corporate interests to um, to undermine these negotiations and their rights of Indigenous peoples in Canada. Um, they have passed a, an, an LNG, a natural gas pipeline in um, the Pacific Northwest, um, regardless of the fact that they have these international agreements. So they're doing a lot of things domestically that are undermining, which what they're saying here is not is not meeting the same things that are happening back home. Um, another thing I wanted to uh, acknowledge was that uh, my, my resistance against all this uh, just comes naturally, uh, just for the fact that I'm, I am an Anishinaabe woman. Um, I don't see this as a job or as work or anything like that, but I, I see a grave injustice that needs to, that needs to, um, to be highlighted on an international level uh, and to do solidarity work with Indigenous peoples of, across Canada that are across the world that the economy um, is ruling my country, it is a ruling the world, and capitalism has, has caused this, has caused this. Um, and we need to shift away from capitalism in the way that we see it. Um, I can't align myself with ex exploitation the same way somebody in a suit would, um, because they see things through money. And um, when they see that you can't have you can't live life uh, exploiting uh, without consequence. And it's, it's, the, it's the women that face the most consequences. And we're the ones that are, are faced with the most violence because they know that we will never give up, that we will always speak up. Um, and we'll always be there to challenge them and hold them accountable to what they say and what they have done um, to the Mother Earth. Um, and yeah, I just want to say that uh, I'm, I'm happy to be able on this panel with uh, amazing women from all over the world. Uh, it's, a truly, it's truly an honor. Miigwech. Uh, hello, good afternoon. My name is Carmen Capriles. I come from Bolivia. Uh, I'm here to share um, uh, uh, my story as an activist um, fighting not only against climate change but against extractivism in, uh, in my country. Right now, 
we are facing like uh, an activist nightmare because we are having all these projects that we never thought that a country like Bolivia, which has uh, Mother Earth uh, law to protect and to take care of the land, uh, would accept all these kinds of projects. But unfortunately, it has opened the doors to Chinese enterprises, Chinese companies to, do, to, to start looking for all kinds of resources, among which are like, for example, oil. Uh, and in that sense, um, a couple of months ago, uh, this, an, a Chinese oil company has found uh, people that are living on voluntary isolation. These are indigenous groups that have not uh, that have not been assimilated and that are still living in the deep part of the forest. Uh, we are in the 21st century. And in Latin America, the estimation is around 100 of uh, people living in voluntary isolation. And these people have been living like that for thousands of years. But now these oil companies that are deep digging deeper and deeper into the jungle, into the rainforest, and deeper and deeper into the earth have, have found this, 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 this are finding these non-contacted people, not only in Bolivia, but also there are stories in Ecuador, there are also stories in Peru, and these stories are not coming out. So we really don't know what the future of these people is. So for us, it's a, it's a threshold. It's a threshold that has been crossed. And we cannot allow oil companies to keep on digging as far as they can. We have to, there, there has to be things that have been protected. That's why we have sacred lands. That's why we have protected areas. That's why we have uh, this kind of, uh, 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 this kind of places of territories that we have to take care. And if uh, the indi indigenous knowledge uh, understands this very well, that's why they have uh, among the structure, among the cosmovision, things that are sacred. But in our world, in the 21st century globalized world, there's nothing sacred except money. So whatever gives you money can, can do anything it wants. Another struggle that we're currently having is that they want to build a, a mega hydroelectric dam in the middle of um, a river that's part of the Amazonian basin. This river uh, connects five nations. One is the Moseten, the Takana, the Chiman, the Uchupiamonas, and the Lecos. And I'm very happy and honored to have here one of the Lecos authorities, which is a woman. Este es, y aquí estoy muy feliz de tener a una de las autoridades, <laughs> de las autoridades Lecas that are going to be affected by this mega dam. There's around uh, 50 communities that are going to be underwater. This mega dam is going to make a lake of uh, around 1,000 square kilometers. And I believe that's bigger than Maldives or in many, many countries. So uh, right now we're fighting against this mega dam because my energy, the energy that I consume although this energy is going to be exported to Brazil, cannot cost as much as a whole community losing their resources, losing their ways of life. So for us, it's very important to acknowledge that and to st start putting some limits. Uh, the indigenous right now are making vigils and are stopping the government from doing this, this mega dam. And is, uh, we know it's going to be a long-term struggle and we welcome everybody who wants to join into this struggle because uh, these this indigenous populations uh, have resisted, many of them have resisted the Inca Empire. They have resisted uh, uh, the colony, the Spanish colony. They have resisted the Republic, but they are not going to resist the plurinational state where we're living right now. 
So the time is running for us, not only in climatic terms, but also in in other in other sense. We cannot lose cultures. We cannot lose what is still sacred for everybody. We we need to start sharing a vision and start sharing a feeling and to start putting limits and especially putting limits to these oil companies or the companies that want the, the resources and ourselves have to start putting limits because we cannot be so thirsty of energy that we don't care where it's coming from. We have to make that clear and we have to ask for uh, accountability and we have to ask for energy that can uh, that can really uh, have a friendly impact and will not affect communities and will not affect the way of life of people and will not affect sacred grounds. So we must think about that and we must start making a transition, a transition that is just, a transition that is fair, a transition that believes on the democratization of energy basically and that takes care of uh, resources like water and so on and believes that all these different ways and approaches of life have a right to exist among this very big but limited planet. Thank you. Thank you so much for these amazing uh, voices from women around the world. And we're gonna be taking a few questions in the time we have left, but I wanted to just also highlight something that's really important which is that, um, and before I do that, I'm gonna, uh, my communications uh, director just reminded me if there's any press, why you raise your hand, she would like to make sure she contacts you. We have some postcards we're gonna hand out. Um, but before I take a few questions, I wanna just mention a few things I think are key for people to understand after you've heard all the wisdom and strength and courage of these frontline women is that uh, between 60 and 80% of all household food production in developing countries is done by women. So when we talk about food security or food sovereignty, you must involve women. Uh, water programs in developing countries, uh, study after study shows if you don't involve women in these programs, it doesn't work because they're collecting the water, they study the land, they're looking at the water knowledge, they're the keepers of the water, you need to engage women. They're the ones collecting the seeds that are gonna guide us through this really tumultuous time of climate change. Um, we look everywhere, we see the strength of women on food, energy, water security. And many times when we look at climate change, we see that it's so vast and huge that we look at all these top-down measures of uh, solutions, which are very important. But equally, if not more important, are these localized solutions, local economy, local food shed, local watersheds. And who are there at the helm are the women. They have the social capital at the local level. They're the ones in the communities doing this work. And um, I don't, I mean, I think after hearing all these women, you can understand that we absolutely cannot get to sustainability. And through this climate crisis, without women's leadership, we need to ensure that they're empowered. We need to make sure that they're funded. And also this is true in you know, the wealthier countries in the United States, about 80% of all consumer purchases is decided by women. If we really want a clean transition to renewable energy and we want to get everyone off of fossil fuels and change our markets, you better involve women. So I could go on and on about women's empowerment and what they do when they're put into parliamentary or government positions and how they vote towards better uh, environmental policies. That's why I shared the report with you earlier, but I, I just wanted to give some stats behind this because it's not just that it feels good and it's morally correct, which we should support women. The fact is you cannot move forward without women's leadership. And I really encourage you to look at your own work, your own organizations and ensure that you have gender equality. So with that, um, let's go ahead and get some questions from the audience. We've got some time here, please go ahead. Hi, I just wanna thank you all for the amazing things that you have said and to share my sympathy and my sorrow 
with you for the struggles that you currently go through. I think the word that you used at the beginning of genocide is a word that we need to use more here. And I think we can also put it together with the word femicide. I want to in particular thank my colleague from Canada because I am Canadian and I can tell you, I moved to Canada when I was eight years old. And I can tell you that's a long time ago. And I do not remember a time when it was not the case that the only environmental action going on in Canada to stop not just oil, but also logging, which is what Canada did to its forests in the 20th centuries, is going down as one of the great environmental crimes of all history. And all of those involve genocide of the indigenous peoples. Even the Mi'kmaq now on the East Coast are starving every day because of the conditions that they are kept in on the, on, on the reservation. So thank you for all the work uh, that you do. And I hope we can continue to work together because I remember the clay clot, it was 35 years ago. Every single environmental action in Canada has begun because the indigenous peoples, the men and the women who have come together to start those movements for us. So I'm afraid the struggle will never stop, but I think the word here is not just transition. The word is transformation. Transformation on the issue of climate change will be the transformation that also will bring justice for indigenous peoples and I hope other people throughout the planet. Thank you so much. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I think there's a, oh, there's a question here. Okay, first here and then there. Gracias, mi nombre es Yvonne Ramos, soy de Ecuador y pertenezco a una acción ecológica, una organización ecologista. Y bien, la pregunta en concretísimo sería para la compañera de Guatemala y de Chile, eh, preguntarles cuáles son las acciones específicas que las mujeres están ejerciendo en sus propios territorios. Pero una reflexión solamente al respecto a la situación Okay, let's take a few questions her, and then the we'll question will go specifically to the women from Chile and Guatemala to ask what specific questions women around the world are taking or what women in your community are taking to make this change. So we're going to get a few questions and then we're going to hand it to, to all of you. There's a question right here on the floor and then this woman here in the white shirt and then we'll take it to the panelists. Uh, hi, I'm from Brazil and I work in a local community of traditional fishermen and my question would be how we can start women empowerment on the ground like i work with lots of women and sometimes they have nothing to do the whole day because only their um their husbands work and we have to fight for the territory because the government wants to displace these people even though they're a traditional community and women are much more active in the fight for the territory than the men, but we don't have a methodology. We, we, it's, it's just organic and natural. It just, it's happening because they need to defend their land. Uh, so from your experience, what would be a good place to start to build this empowerment movement for women? Thanks. Thank you. We'll take one more question. Oh, and then we'll come back for more questions. And yeah, we'll come back to you. Hi, um, I just want to thank you all for bringing spirit and soul to this event, to this conference. Like, I really appreciate it. Um, and I was wondering, um, I'm from Brown University, and I'm wondering what actions you can expect from people from developed nations, from non-Indigenous communities to stand in solidarity with you. What actions can we take to support your resistance? Great question. Yeah. And then we'll come back for another round of questions. Uh, so um, who would like to respond? Primero, la pregunta sobre para las mujeres en Chile y Guatemala. ¿Cuáles son las acciones concretas que las mujeres están liderando en sus comunidades? Las acciones concretas que están realizando las mujeres principalmente es las prácticas agroecológicas para el consumo de las nuevas generaciones eh, de la comida propia. En el caso de Guatemala se consume el maíz y la conservación de las semillas. O sea, mantener las semillas propias de nosotras y con prácticas orgánicas para la protección y el uso del Del, de los eh, conocimientos ancestrales, recuperar y empezar a decirle a la juventud que ahora que es necesario, porque mucha de la juventud están en la parte del mundo tecnológico, pero hay que hacer ese vínculo, la tecnología con los saberes ancestrales. Sorry. Um, what she's saying is that uh, as, a, as concrete actions, what they are doing is uh, working in agroecology. Uh, they have their their ancestral practices on how to produce food, and they are teaching that to the new generation. Uh, they also um, are working on, uh, uh, on, their, 
on their ancestral practices. They are producing organically and healthy. And they think that uh, this work with the young generation, it's necessary. And that is, uh, they, they have to make the, the link between the ancestral knowledge and today's new technology. And it, because that's needed. In the case of Chile, one of the practices that is realizing is, for example, planting alfalfa in the zona montaña, which is not eh, ideal, but it is taking the water from very far to be able to have forage in the temporadas where there is no alimento for the animals. And in that way, preserve our animals. Well, in Chile, in the highlands, one of the practices that they're having is they are planting uh, uh, alfalfa, which is uh, one of the forages for the animals. And this crop uh, absorbs the water and it keeps it into, into the ground and into the place. So it doesn't wash uh, the, the, the soil. So that this is helping deal with the droughts and also to give, uh, to have um, food for the animals. Uh, Sadie, did you want, or you can wait, yeah. it's, just, it's up to you. I think we'll go to the next question, because um, that one was directed just to the women of Chile. No, there was others. Guatemala, so. and yes, the just next question to be for, I asked her to rephrase again, and that for women that do not come from an organization, for real women on the front lines, grassroots women, how do they get involved with a climate movement? How do they take this forward? Is that, yeah. And then there was the other question as well, which was around how non-Indigenous allies can support this work. So let's go ahead. Um, Sadie, do you want to say anything, or we can move down the line? I mean, I can I can respond a little in a little bit. Okay, great. Part. That's fine. Um, okay, just we'll we'll come back to them in a minute. Just one minute. Phil, go ahead. Um, okay. Oh, did you want to respond now? I I, wasn't sure. I can respond after. No, no, go ahead. I thought you were saying you wanted to wait. Okay. Um, no, I what I just wanted to say was that there's. Um, that this fight is not only just for indigenous women, it's for all women, and that like women in general are, are, are water carriers for the fact that they give life, and therefore there's always room for them within this uh, movement of uh, protecting Mother Earth, um, because you're, all women are ultimately a daughter of her. Um, and another thing around non-indigenous people, how can they can support? Um, really amplifying what is being heard, the knowledges and the stories um, and the, the injustices that are happening and, and to ask uh, or to question other non-Indigenous people that are, are saying it's not relevant. That well, it's an area that people aren't around. Thank you. Bill? And you guys can just so, signal me. I'm just trying to figure out. Go ahead, Phil. Unless we can influence the decision makers, that is our elected officials, leaders, there is no way we can bring transformational change. And in order to do that, we have to make climate change an election issue. And without making climate change an election issue, we can't bring transformational change. So we need grassroots mobilizations. We need to press... Elected officials, the politicians, they do what voters ask them to do. So we need to make this an election issue. We need to ensure when they go to the ballot boxes that we, the people, are asking for leaders who would support, who would be pro-environmental, who would not, who, we are not electing officials who are funded by the fossil fuel industry. So we need to do that. You, you can specifically for you, uh, from developed world uh, uh, university students from developed world, you can find out grassroots organizations and movements that are close to you and get involved and be mobilized. So we, it, this is the time now. If we don't resist now, and if we don't protest now, if we don't act now, there's nothing we can do to save the planet. So I think it's very important to get involved in the grassroots movements and get mobilized now. Shall we take more questions or do you want to respond to these? Uh, quiero responder. Uh, Should we take some more questions or respond more? Hello. Sí. Sí, sí. Bueno, lo primero, organizarse con mujeres 
porque las mujeres podemos liderar grandes luchas, lo hemos demostrado a través de la historia. Entonces, la fuerza y el ímpetu de la mujer hay que coaccionarlo para poder llevar adelante la lucha. Habiendo un, una, un, un, una inspiración, una, un, algo que nos motive, nosotros nos movemos. Entonces, hay que empezar por ahí, para juntarlas a todas. Uh, okay, what, what she's saying is that women need to organize. They have to start organizing themselves the best way they can, because women have carried on lots of fights and lots of wars. And the other thing they need is some kind of inspiration, <laughs> inspiration that will help them to, that will lead them to the action. So those are the two things that she recommends that uh, they need in order to fight for their territories. Mm -hmm. I also just wanted to uh, expand on what you were saying earlier about um, the femicide. Um, I think that it's, it's, it really it did happen in North America because women were the, the leaders, they were the government, they were everything within indigenous territories in Canada. Um, they ran matriarchal societies Uh, and now we're seeing as like women are, are at the very bottom. You have white men, white women, brown men, white, brown women. And they're at the very bottom for a specific reason because of that. And the, the violence that they have, are faced because of doing that. Um, I don't know if anyone has known, heard about the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls uh, and highlighting the national inquiry around why there's violence against women. And people are seeing that... Um, why indigenous women are being targeted and who's actually doing this violence against them. Um, women on the ground that are doing the, the that are exchanging, um, um, they're saying it's, it's politicians, it's judges, it's police, and there's reasons for that. And it's not being vocalized in the way that, um, or highlighted in, in a way, because women are the ones that are actually being very vocal about things. They're talking about the injustices, uh, and it is very much a femicide. And, Um, it was very strategic in the way that they did so. So yeah. Thank you. For, thank you for that comment. Um, I wanted to catch some more questions. Hi, my name is uh, Barbara Bandler from Zambia. Uh, my question is uh, for Precious. Um, I'd just like to make a statement before I ask my question. Um, one of the major things we have in this world is that women, yes, we're the most vocal, but we're not the very we're not the most supportive of each other's efforts. And I'm sorry I have to bring it up again. Hillary Clinton is a, is a major part. Uh, when you look at Hillary Clinton's campaign result and you look at most uh, American women voted for Donald Trump, that just shows you how we don't support each other as women on a day-to-day -day basis in our development efforts. Precious, I wanted to know how, um, uh, what type of regeneration agriculture you use and how many women have you affected and how is your government supporting your efforts to scale up those efforts throughout Zimbabwe and possibly partnerships in other parts of Southern, Afri uh, of Southern Africa. Because I think one of the major issues we have is that our governments don't realize our efforts in terms of what women are doing on the grassroots. So how are you scaling up in Zimbabwe? Great, thank you. Let's take another question or two. Go ahead, please go ahead. In the back there, perfect. Okay. Uh, Janina Sibehe from Morocco, university teacher and uh, active in civil society. I think that uh, my, my general remark is that maybe we forget to take into consideration uh, differences and uh, discrepancies between the situation of women in different continents, not to speak about uh, the, their situation in different countries within the same continent. Okay? I think that we should have different policies for different categories of women. We, we should speak about some kind of marketing in this. So we should, we should segment women. We're not all the same. There are women, as you say, who are indigenous, some who are housewives, others more ministers, some more governing elsewhere. So I think that, I think that for, uh, to face climatic change or climate change, we need to take consideration these differences. So this gender approach should be much more specific, much more focused on differences between women. Second, I would like to evoke the question of education and culture. We should think of education, the, ed the education of small girls in schools, 
because we know, for example, that in Morocco, there are some parts in the countryside where there is no schooling for girls, especially when they get their primary school certificate, then the secondary school is far away from the home. And there is a culture that says that, no, there are risks in sending girls to study far away from house. The second thing is culture. I've heard around, I'm sorry because I was not there since the beginning, but I've heard around that we shouldn't change culture. No, we should. Our problems come from our cultures, especially traditional, conventional cultures, which really emphasize this inferiority of women, that women should be there to help the husband, to take care of kids. In Islam, you know, it's taken as, it is a crime if you forget to be uh, uh, let's say a, uh, a slave to the family, to the in-laws even. Then the responsibility of media, please. The media should start advocating this cause of climate change. Sometimes they're oblivious of this. So I think Thank that, you. Thank you uh, so much. So that these, are, these are suggestions and questions at the same time. Thank so, you. so I think that we should take these into consideration. Around in these side events, I have seen that these questions have been thank you uh, yeah thank you. thank you thank you so much Sorry thank you so much so thank you so much there's a gentleman here and it would be good to get some gender mix here and we right. only have um you know less than 10 minutes left yeah. in the conference so we would appreciate short questions only so we can hear from our wonderful speakers can you there's a gentleman right here with his tie right here i've already yeah. asked her first she'll oh, be here okay. and the gentleman will be next okay Thank you very much. I was almost going to protest if you weren't going to give me the microphone. <laughs> My name is Rita Owaka. I am a Nigerian and I live in Nigeria. I work with Environmental Rights Action Friends of the Earth Nigeria and I coordinate the Forest and Biodiversity Program for Friends of the Earth Africa. Uh, today, uh, the truth is that if we're talking about climate change and we don't talk about gender justice, then it's not complete. Uh, Majority of our communities are the best custodians of resources, but yet they are the worst hit by climate change. And that is a very big problem that we have to put on the table. And in Nigeria, a lot of issues are happening. Uh, a sister, one of our sisters uh, was talking about regenerating our land. And I was just thinking, how can we regenerate our land when we don't even have land? When our lands have been taken over by transnational companies in the name of development, agro commodities are populating our land, and these products are taken to the international market to feed international markets and impoverished community people who live on ground and play host to these resources. And how can we regenerate our land when our forested landmass, a price tag is being put on it all in the name of red? And our fish ponds and farmlands are polluted by oil spills. How can we regenerate in such context? Mm -hmm. We need to think and look inward and see how we can work together and build more alliance within the network, within the region and across the world where women are directly impacted by various environmental challenges, you know, that it's all encompassing. So yeah. I think this is an opportunity for us to, to think of solutions that we can bring to the table to create the necessary change that we desire. Absolutely, thank, thank you. you. We're, we're with you on all of those um, critiques and uh, difficulties. So thank you for that. Let's take one last question and then we're gonna hand it back to the panelists. Uh, my name is Bramley. I'm sorry for the tie, but I'm a Trojan horse because I'm fighting the nuclear lobby tomorrow. So I have to slip in. So, but I come from a small indigenous tribe. It's called the Kasi tribe, and we are matriarchal and matrilineal. Uh, my mother, I have my mother's name, and men are just a seed. So the inheritance is to the mother, and the name of the children is to the mother, and it's been like that for generations. But uh, my home is facing the worst possible scenario, like Pandora, Avatar. We have uh, sacred forests, living wood bridges, but we have 10 million tons of high-grade uranium. So my government wants to mine uranium in India to build nuclear weapons. So we're going to be wiped out. But the land belongs to the woman. So they need to ask permission from the woman. So one woman has a mountain, a lot of uranium, and the government says, here's $350,000. Can you sell your land? She said, shove your cash. Get out of my land. So that's just one woman. So when the 
land is owned by a woman, then she needs to make the decision is different. I want to ask the same question to you. What is the land tenorship system in Bolivia, New Ecuador, and Peru? How do you control workers? I know after the colonies, land tenors has shifted, but I think women need to have control over resources. They need to change the system like our sister here said, because the old system is no good when the men control. They rape the land, they rape the planet, I'm sorry. But I think women need to control the land and the water and the resources so they can say no to governments. And then you can work with the young people also and train them to say no, the next generation. Thank you. Good question. You can tell that uh, uh, that gentleman was raised by powerful women. <laughs> it shows the difference. <laughs> thank you. Um, we need those examples. So thank you for speaking out and sharing your culture. Uh, we have, you know, probably about five minutes left. We will try to cheat that. I don't know if they actually remove us from this space. I have no idea what happens. So uh, I would like to give all the panelists a chance to just make some responses to these great questions and just make a concluding remark. Um, let's give each of you a minute, you know, sorry for the time limitations, but um, let's just go down the line. Everybody has a minute for concluding remark. Thank you so much. And maybe Emily, you could help us with keeping time. Emily, if you could help us keep time, each one gets one minute. Please go ahead. We're, let's start with Carmen and come this way. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for all the comments in, in the first place. Um, I, I totally agree with Patricia that it's not only transition, but it's transformation that we need, that we need uh, in one term that I use a lot in this system change, not climate change that we need, is self-sufficiency. We need to start uh, taking care of, of ourselves and trying to be as much self-sufficient as we can, because that way we stop depending on companies. And in the question of land, how is in my country? Well, there are indigenous, indigenous communities uh, that cannot be separated. And, but unfortunately, they're, they're going to be flooded. So that's why it's important to take into account uh, that uh, the, these indigenous territories because it's needed to uh, to uh, to conserve it's distracting me Emily <laughs> to conserve these cultures for the future thank you thank you um, for me as like um, yeah we, I definitely think that we need to rematriate our societies um, I do believe that all societies were matriarchal at one point, um, but then lost their way um, for you know, either colonization or um, male greed. Um, but uh, yeah, me I feel like men that strive that they're trying to do the best for their communities because of um, poverty and therefore will compromise or jeopardize the land in order for the short-term benefits that it will have for the community for for however long it runs out. Um, I do see that they're they're trying to do something, but when having women in leadership, they see um, <coughs> the generations ahead that will rely on that uh, on those lands. And um, men, I, I don't think that men can see that far as farther as, um, as women do because they are life givers uh, and that. They, they see the life that their children will have. They'll see the, the, the life that their children children will have. And, and men are kind of more of like, right now, we need to ensure our, our, our community is okay. Uh, and a lot of times because of dealing with genocide and dealing with uh, isolation or dealing with uh, environmental impacts that, and poverty, uh, they make these decisions on our behalf. Uh, and it has a huge impact on future generations. So I definitely believe that we need to rematriate. Thank you. Okay, so I'll respond to Zambia. Um, my particular skill is in holistic management, which is educating communities uh, in holistic learning and livestock management. But the scaling up part, well, there is an institution called Savory Institute that works in a hub system that is across the world. There's a hub in Zimbabwe, there's a hub in Malawi, so it's expanding. And there are networks that work with these hubs. And so we grow like that and we work hand in hand with government extension officers on the ground because they are our main support and our main voice in our communities. 
So that's really uh, short and to the point. And regeneration is a regeneration of everything, relations, land, and our societies. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Uh, Rita de Nigeria, eh, debemos buscar espacios en común para unificar nuestra lucha, porque la lucha de los pueblos indígenas tiene que ser no solamente de las mujeres indígenas, sino de todas las mujeres del mundo. Eso, um, y el hermano de, quickly, de... Rita from Nigeria, she says that all women have to unite their voices, all women have to uh, fight for this common voice. Y el hermano de que tiene uranio, eh, es primera vez que escucho que en algún lugar de pueblos indígenas las mujeres tienen ese poder. Qué bueno que exista un lugar por lo menos. Creo que en todos los lugares debería de estar eso. And for a brother of the that has uranium mines, he she's really happy to hear that in there is one place where women have the ownership of the land. And she's very happy for you, and she con congratulates you, and that should, that should be like that in all the world. Sin la participación de la mujer, no hay liberación. Without the participation of women, there is no liberation. <laughs> Without the participation of women, there is no liberation. Thank you so much. Woo. We say, let's connect, let's work together and join it together and we can be successful. Thank you. What climate science is saying, we don't have any time. We don't have time to even open a single new coal plant. The negotiations are not moving forward. We need action on ground. We need to mobilize, we need to organize, we need to resist the oil companies and Without, we need grassroots movement. So we need to mobilize on the ground and we need to support the movements that are happening around the world. The water protectors, the tar sand marches, the rainforest marches. We need to get involved and we need to get out there. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for an incredible panel. Let's give them a big applause. We are going to do, uh, maybe we could all stand together and say, act on climate, act on climate, okay? This is our message uh, to the governments of the world. Okay, yeah. And we're going to say together, act on climate now. Act on climate now, act on climate now, act on climate now.